So designing a highly available and performant service is really difficult, but booking.com does it really well. The rating and review service is one of the most critical services for booking. And in this video, we dive deep into how they designed and scaled it to ensure that they seamlessly handle a peak traffic of more than 10,000 requests per second. But before we move forward, I'd like to talk to you about a course on system design that I've been running for over a year and a half now. The course is a cohort based course, which means I won't be rambling a solution and it will not be a monologue at all. Instead, a small focused group of 50 to 60 engineers will be brainstorming the systems and designing it together. This way, we build a very solid system and learn from each other's experiences. The course is enrolled by 800 plus engineers spanning 12 cohorts and 12 countries. Engineers from companies like Google, Microsoft, GitHub, Slack, Facebook, Tesla, Yelp, Flipkart, Dream11 and many 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 more have taken this course and have some wonderful things to say. The course is focused on building systems the way they are built in the real world. We will be focusing heavily on building the right intuition so that you are ready to build any and every system out there. We will be discussing the trade-offs of every single decision we make just like how you do in your team. We cover topics ranging from real-time text communication for Slack to designing our own toilet balancer to quick buses live text commentary to doing impressions counting at scale. In all, we would be covering roughly 28 systems and the detailed curriculum split week by week can be found in the course page linked in the description down below. So if you're looking to learn system design from the first principles, you will love this course. I have two offerings for you. The first one is the live cohort based course and the second one is the recorded offering. The live cohort based course happens once every two months and will go on for eight weeks while the recorded course contains the recordings from one of the past cohorts as is. If you are in a hurry and want to learn and want to binge learn system design, I would recommend going you for the recorded one. Otherwise, the live cohort is where you can participate and discuss the systems and its design live with me and the entire cohort. The decision is totally up to you. The course details, prerequisites, testimonials can be found on the course page arpitbhani.me slash masterclass. I repeat arpitbhani.me slash masterclass and I would highly recommend you to check that out. I've also put the link of this course page in the description down below and I'm looking forward to see you in my next cohort. So on booking.com you can book flights, hotels, stays, tours and much more. But the core reason why booking.com thrives is because of its review system. Because the thing is that using reviews people make informed decisions that hey do I need to book this hotel or is this hotel or is this stay or is this tour really good enough. And the more important part over here is that reviews are authentic, which means that a person cannot post a review unless that person has booked something on booking.com, which means that all the reviews that you see on booking, they're genuine. Now, this is really important for a system. Why? Because when you see, when people know that the information that they are being thrown at or like the information that they see I, is authentic, they make a lot of decisions according to that. So now people are coming to booking to read the reviews and then make an informed decision ki, hey, I want to book this particular hotel. So now what does this mean? This means that reviews become their top of the funnel. So people come on booking.com to read the reviews about a place or about a stay or about a tour and they book after that. So this becomes the top of the funnel, which means that it drives their core business, which means that reviews service cannot go down. Classic, classic, classic problem statement. So here this service needs to be supporting a very high availability and a very low latency. Because this service is something that everyone is having their eye on that this service has to be up and running because this is what is driving their core feature. No one really thinks about rating and review system that much. But here, because this is the top of the funnel, it becomes critically important for an organization to have it up and running 24 seven. Right. Okay. Now that we understand why ratings and review service needs to be highly available, we would take a look at how they do it. But this gives us a hint on how they would be thinking about this thing. Okay, so we need high availability, we need low latency. 
So obviously, with respect to when you think about ratings and review service, it would be a very simple REST based API in which you can get a review, create a review, get a bunch of reviews, list a review by location, by uh, tours, by accommodation and whatnot, right? So it will be assumed that that's a very simple REST based service written in Python, Java or basically whichever framework you would want. That's a normal REST based endpoint which is exposed, right? Now, given that, how do you make this thing highly available and low latency. Now let's start with that. Now, the kind of traffic that they expect on this particular service is a peak traffic of 10,000 requests per second with the P99, which is 99th percentile of the response time to be 50 millisecond. Now this indicates that the reviews that you see on booking, they have to be mostly served from cache and pre-materialized views. Now what are materialized views? You create, you can, on your relational databases, you can create materialized views so that you don't spend time doing redundant joins again. So this materialized views make your reads much faster, right? And plus a centralized cache like Redis, Memcache, Couchbase, something, something around that you can use to build it, right? But this gives a critical hint that because we need low latency, we would go for a something like a cache-based solution. So cache and pre-materialized views are two classic ways to get uh, the max performance out of the system. Okay. That being said, now let's think about the amount of data that they have because this gives us glimpse around the, the overall database architecture that they might have. Okay, so amount of data is what they say is they have 250 million reviews and hyper and let's say and no, each reviews uh, each review contains uh, answers to some objective questions like basic questions like on the scale of one to five, how much did you like this? What did this place have A, B or C? You you check 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 on that right. Then rating on various parameters and a textual feedback, right? So given this, the overall size, let's assume is 2 KB. So if we assume 2 kilobyte per review and let's say there are 250 million reviews, so 250 million multiplied by 2 KB is rough, is basically 500 GB. So it's decent enough storage. It's not very small. It's not very huge, but it's decent enough. 500 GB just to store ratings and reviews to render on the interface. It's pretty decent, right? Obviously not all reviews are getting surfaced. The most recent one or the most popular ones are getting surfaced, but still this is big enough storage. Now this means that for us to have a response time under 50 millisecond that we just observed like P99 is less than 50 millisecond which means that we need to have a database sharded. It's not because of high amount of data but more about high amount of load that we are seeing on the system which means that we cannot just rely on a single data node because it's very high traffic 10,000 requests per second one node definitely cannot handle it with ease uh, so we would add a bunch of replicas. So we would typically have a master, which is taking all the writes, replica, which is serving a lot of reads and, and very importantly, because we want the service to be highly available. For example, what if you have hosted this service in a database and that region, that AWS region or that GCP region or that, or that Azure region is down, is cut off due to any reason. Maybe the database data center is down. So what do you need to do? You Because you cannot just say, hey, AWS is down, I can't do anything. Because your business comes first, even if AWS is down or GCP is down or Azure is down. Right? So what we do is we have to make this service highly available. So even if our database is down or that region is down, our system still should be working. So instead, uh, so apart from having a bunch of read replicas to serve the read request, you would have a replica that is replicated or uh, that keeps the replicated data in another availability zone, which means that let's say if your Singapore data center is down, it will be served from let's say Mumbai data center, right? That's the idea behind it. So you would have one replica in the same availability zone and another replica in another avail in other availability zone, right? This would make your service highly available, right? Okay. Given that we have 500 GB of data and a lot of read requests coming in, obviously one node should not be able to, or one node is not able to support that much of request, you shard the data. Now on which parameter would you shard? Typically an accommodation ID, right? Accommodation ID is, let's say hotel ID or tour ID, something around that. Let's call it hotel ID. So like this is the accommodation ID on which I'm sharding. But now a uh, very interesting thing crops up that how do you route the request. So let's say a request came in for a particular accommodation that, hey, give me all the reviews or let's say, let's create a review for this particular accommodation. That how would your review service know which shard to connect to? Which means there has to be some routing logic over here. 
And a most classic, most typical way to do it is a hash based routing where you take the accommodation ID, you mod it with the number of shards that you have, you get an index and on that particular node, you go and fire the query and create the rating or review, right? This is a very classic way to do it. But again, with classic way comes classic challenge. Now here, what happens is, let's say you have three nodes and you have sharded the data according to that to handle the load and whatnot. The data is split very well between this or among these three nodes. But now the challenge comes in, what if you'd want to add a fourth node or let's say you saw enough traffic, but now you have to reduce it. Now, obviously you, if you are provisioned three shards, but you're not seeing enough traffic that the, like you're seeing a traffic that could be very well handled by just one node. Why would you want to have three nodes, like two extra nodes that would just leak money? So that's where you would want to downscale it. So you would want to make this scalable. So add more nodes and remove more nodes on the fly. Now, the challenge with a normal hash based routing, it's very evident that hey, if you add or remove more nodes, the mod number of shards, this would change, which would require you to do re-indexing and repartitioning of the entire data, which means it is not easy for anyone, for anyone, given that there is 500 GB worth of data to repartition the data among the new set of nodes. Right. And that would be extremely costly. So you typically don't do that, which means you would be leaking money. So adding more nodes to handle more peaks, it's not possible. So you have to be always over provisioned for the peak that you are about to handle. So that is where to make this thing really efficient, cost efficient per se, what you want is you want an ease of, yeah, like you want it to be easy for you to add and remove data nodes from your cluster which means that you should not be having to do the re-indexing and repartitioning of the entire data set. It needs to be minimal. This is a classic hint towards a classic algorithm called consistent hashing because consistent hashing is that one tool or rather is that one algorithm that solves this problem beautifully well. So if you folks don't know about consistent hashing, I would highly recommend you to read my blog post on consistent hashing, which also contains its implementation. You can find it at atwithbhani.me slash blog slash consistent hashing. I'll also link it in the description down below. I've talked about not just the theory, but the implementation part of it as well. And it just takes a sorted array and binary search to implement consistent hashing. There's nothing fancy in it, right? But let me spend some time talking about consistent hashing. now. The core idea of consistent hashing is very simple. You structure it in ring and whatnot, like you'll read it there. But what it answers, it, it answers data ownership. It does nothing fancy. It just says, given a particular review, where would it lie? Simple. All it does is data ownership. Nothing more, nothing less. Right? Given this, given this, where would we put this consistent hashing logic? in the review service, right? Because review service was the one that holds the routing information that earlier, if you're using hash based routing, the request come, the request came to review service, review service would be computing the hash and mod number of shards and find the index and put it there, right? So similarly, the consistent hashing that you implement will be part of your review service, right? So when the request comes in, using consistent hashing, it would find where to forward the request to, it would go and hit the request on that particular shard, right? This solves that problem. So consistent hashing, beautiful algorithm to do minimal data transfer. And that's what the key highlight of consistent hashing is. So what do you get? You get data ownership in very quick time. And second, you do minimal data movement. So in case if one of the node is removed from, uh, so if basically one of the node is removed from the ring, the request would be automatically going to the next node. Right? Now that is what, what a consistent hashing does. So in case you add node to that, or you add more node, you just have to copy data from one of the peripheral nodes. That's it. And that's the beauty of consistent hashing, right? So I've linked my blog in the description down below. Go read that to understand consistent hashing in depth along with implementation, right? But now given that we would have consistent hashing implementation, the routing logic implementation on the review service that we have, what is the practicality of it? Now, how do you resize? Because because huh, consistent hashing, if you use, that does not mean that everything is automatically sorted. Most people think like that, but it's not, right? You have to do a bunch of stuff. Now, let's say, let's say I want to scale up my database cluster, which means instead of having three nodes, I want to, let's say, add a fourth node. 
When I want to do that, when I add the fourth node, I would first find the location of it in my consistent hashing ring that I have. I'll place it there and then I find, okay, it's placed over here. So now the request that was going over here, like wherever the request was going, you would copy the data from that dependent node onto this. So what you need is you add a node in the ring, you first copy the data from the other node, like the minimal data transfer that we are talking about from one of the previous nodes that you have, you copy the data, you wait until the data that needs to be moved over here, it moves there. Once it has moved, then you notify the review service that, hey, now you can use the other ring. So just to give you a, a, a nice crisp gist of it is that your review service has a consistent hashing ring available. Using that, it basically routes the request to the corresponding shard. Now, when you add one new node into this consistent hashing ring, you first wait until some data, uh, until the data that needs to be moved to this particular node moves there, right? And once that data is moved, once that node is ready to accept the request, then you notify the review service about the existence of this new node in the new ring. So you create an instance of consistent hashing ring. That's it. So just a logical array. That's it, right? You then tell the review service, hey, now you use this ring instead of the old ring. Then the next request that comes in starts hitting the new node. Like right? So now you would have four nodes in your cluster right? and everyone serving the request. Now, this is what you do practically. Right? So add and remove the node that you would want to copy the data that needs to be moved by, by balancing. And obviously not a lot of data would happen. Only data from the peripheral nodes would move nothing more. Right? And that's the beauty of it. It's about minimal data transfer. And you notify the review service to start consuming the new ring. Right? So this way, the new request goes to the new nodes and you balance the load across four nodes now. Right? This technique is can be used across any service that you are designing. So wherever you see a problem of you wanting to build a service that needs to scale up and down at will, and there is a lot of data that is moving because of your routing logic, you employ consistent hashing at that location. Once you employ consistent hashing at that location, your problem is typically solved because it ensures that you have to do a minimal data movement when you add or remove nodes from the consistent hashing ring that you have. And again, do remember that all consistent hashing answers is data ownership. It does not, it's not a magical function that would automatically scale any system. Don't think of it like that. All it does, all it does is answer data ownership that, hey, given this thing, where who owns this? That's all. It does nothing more, nothing less. And that's really important for you to know. Don't think it's such a magical solution, right? Okay, now that's the practicality of resizing. Now. What does high level architecture of this entire design look like? It's a pretty simple one, right? But what do you have? You have a bunch of users firing a lot of requests onto a review service. Review service has a consistent hashing implementation who's using which it basically routes the request to the corresponding sharded, to the corresponding shard of your sharded database. Now here you typically use MySQL because they mentioned that they use pre-materialized views, which means it has to be relational database. So they use a relational database to store ratings and reviews and whatnot. And they, and this ownership info and, uh, the database cluster is mentioned in the consistent hashing ring, depending on which your review service would route the request to the corresponding node. Review service uses a cache because we saw that P99 response time has to be less than 50 milliseconds, which means that they would be, or they are using cache to serve most of the latest reviews, but still a bunch of when users scroll, let's say you render first 10 reviews through cache, but beyond that, the request comes to the DB, which is where pre-materialized views comes in, right? Then for each of the master, for each of the sharded database that you have, you would have a replica in the same availability zone and a replica in another availability zone. Now these, both of these replications are asynchronous replication and not synchronous replication because you don't need synchronous. Synchronous replication across different availability zone is, you should not be doing that. It would increase your latency by a huge amount. So that's why you do this asynchronously and asynchronous replication within the same availability zone as well. Now, key things that they, what they did, they did materialized views on your database to improve latency, then your high cache hit ratio to ensure P99 less than 50 milliseconds. And third, because availability is critical, they have a copy of data 
of a read replica present in different availability zone so in case if the node goes down or the region cuts off you would be serving the request from the database present in another availability zone and this is how you think about any system at hand what are the key criterias that you definitely have to have for example availability low latency low latency you add cache availability you ensure that everything is available everything in your architecture goes down and then you build on top of that and that's how you should be thinking about any problem at hand there is no magic question answer thing in system design everything is a trade-off understanding and reading between the lines is really important to do so and just to reiterate consistent hashing again is not a magical solution not at all a magical solution you have to know it just does two things answers data ownership and requires you to do minimal data movement when you add or remove a data node from it but you have to do the data movement the consistent hashing does not do anything right it just tells you data ownership right okay so yeah that's how booking.com does it and this entire thing this entire piece is taken from booking.com's engineering blog around their ratings and review system a link i've linked that blog in the description down below i would highly 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 recommend you to check that out i have also linked my blog on consistent hashing the theory and more importantly implementation in python it's a very simple array and binary search based implementation even a first year kid would understand it. It's just binary search and array. Nothing more, nothing less. It's that simple, right? Again, I would highly recommend you to implement it on your own, right? So if you find it interesting, if you find it amusing, consider supporting this channel by hitting the thanks button down below. A ton of effort goes behind the scenes to create such deep engineering content. So yeah, that is it for this one. If you guys like this video, give this video a thumbs up. If you guys like the channel, give this channel a sub. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a ton.